I'm Sasha Costanza Chuck. I'm assistant professor of civic media at MIT, and uh, I'm here because I'm also a co-founder of the Occupy Research Network. Uh, I'm Christine Schweidler. I am director of strategic initiatives at the Data Center at datacenter.org, uh, and I'm here talking about Occupy Research and research justice. Uh, so part of our talk was actually talking about uh, Occupy Research as a network, which is an open uh, distributed network of researchers uh, who are looking to looking at sort of movement growth and movement development and movement composition and a lot of sort of different aspects of the Occupy movement um, in order to support uh, you know movement building work, including ourselves. Yeah, so we're both interested in sort of engaged research and research justice. So how can research be done in a way? that uh, actually meets the needs of communities and social movement organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't yet done the, all the cross tabs on the Occupy uh, survey data that we have. Um, I think that you'll find across different locations there are some very similar practices going on in terms of the diversification of the media space, the increase in uh, sort of participatory media making, the way that mass media organizations have started to shift from trying to ignore uh, social media to trying to integrate it and incorporate it into the work that they do. Um, so I think everywhere we're seeing a diversification of the media platforms that people have access to. Despite some ideas that people initially had in Occupy that they were being sort of censored or blocked out for mass media coverage. In fact, once Occupy reached a sort of critical mass, there was a lot of coverage uh, of the movement, and I think that some of the work that we've done really does uh, show that. However, then the question becomes what kind of coverage, how is it framed? Of course, uh, you know, mass media traditionally uses particular frames around protesters especially, so they look for violent conflict with the police. They tend to ignore uh, the actual uh, sort of substance of what uh, people who are mobilized are talking about. In the case of Occupy, I think there was actually ended up being a lot of sympathetic coverage, uh, you know, to the movement during a certain period of time. And actually, mass media as well as social media helped spread the visibility of Occupy. Um, at the same time, um, there were those traditional narratives of it's, you know, it's unfocused, they don't know what they want, it's dirty hippies, they're smelly, good riddance when the police clear them. So all those things are happening at the same time. And uh, actually part of, just to kind of flip that on, on its end as well, we were sort of looking in some of the research that we were doing at, you know, what exactly are folks who are participating in the movement looking at in terms of where they're getting their news and their information. Um, and we're finding that they're getting a lot of it actually from uh, other sort of actors within the movement um, and not necessarily looking straight to mass media as, you know, for, for that coverage or for information uh, about it. Uh, we also sort of wanted to kind of share that we're putting all of the data from the research out there into the world so folks can see because this idea that Sasha just mentioned in terms of what kind of messages are our movement actors wanting to share with the world this was a specific question that we asked simply because the media is often very unsympathetic to this kind of dispersed message or the movement doesn't have a message etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so that is actually also a key goal of ours which is to kind of give create as many opportunities as possible for folks to voice um, and sort of challenge that narrative and in place of that you know share the voices of, of movement actors directly yeah, and also to emphasize something Chris just said about um, sort of the way that people were communicating internally in the Occupy Movement Network. Occupy has been a really generative space for autonomous communication networks. The free software movement got very involved. Anonymous, of course, uh, stepped up to increase the visibility of the movement. Um, you've had lots of hackathons where people are creating different tools, free and open source alternatives to the corporate controlled social media spaces. If you go to Occupy.net, you'll see sort of uh, links through to concrete alternatives to Twitter, to Facebook, to proprietary systems. Um, so there's a lot of interesting, uh, both in, in software but also in the hardware space. So you have the creation of uh, free open peer-to-peer -peer networks, the Freedom Tower, which is a sort of open wireless network, uh, attempts to create mesh networks that can link different occupies and then tunnel from camp to camp uh, using secure uh, VPNs. So uh, I think there's a lot of autonomous communication infrastructure, both hardware and software, that comes out of Occupy uh, that happens alongside the appropriation of the commercial platforms, including the social media and the mass media spaces, to generate and circulate the movement messages. As, as movement-engaged researchers, we're less interested in sort of 
analyzing the movement as this like object of study that we're outside of, and we're more interested in spreading research skills among movement actors, whether it's Occupy or some other type of social movement. So we do concrete sort of hands-on trainings, like this is how you develop a survey, this is how you do data analysis, this is how you scrape your own data from Twitter, which is a private company that holds all of your tweets, well, you need to learn how to use Scraper Wiki and other tools to get all that stuff back so that we can analyze it ourselves. Yeah, and, and again, sort of emphasizing what Sasha just said, you know, we're not trying to tell the story um, in place of other folks trying to tell the story. We're sort of creating opportunities and hoping, you know, to kind of work with folks so that folks will tell their own stories. Um, and that is what's happening in a lot of the working camps as well. You know, we believe that research can be a really strategic tool for movement building. So what does that look like? Well, it depends on what your goals are. So we kind of do a series of workshops, for example. Um, we can, you know, Data Center commonly does workshops with folks where we sort of identify, well, what is the research question and what is the research goal? If it's movement building, if it's actually, you know, challenging messages that are in the media, whatever the case may be, that's not a goal that we're, as researchers, kind of imposing on folks. It's, you know... It depends on who you're who you're talking about. There is definitely an access gap um, in terms of folks who are actually not online. I mean, yes, certainly yes. Um, but for example, for data center, a lot of the organizations that we work with, the communities that we work with, you know, many people still don't have internet access. Period. So they're neither accessing some of the things that we're talking about, nor you know, putting things into that. A lot of it is face-to-face -face communication. A lot of it is through traditional structures of communication and organizing organizational bases within their communities, be it churches, other nonprofits, service centers, et cetera, et cetera. So on the one hand, the new, like the web and new digital media tools and the falling price of consumer goods, including computers and digital cameras and mobile phones especially, mean that more people now, as a percentage of the population, have access to producing and widely circulating their own stories and voices than ever before in human history. So that's awesome. But at the same time, Structural inequality isn't erased by the internet. So all of the ways that uh, st structural inequality uh, along lines of class, income, race, gender, geography, all those things continue. And they continue to also structure who has the most access, who's got always on broadband connectivity and a really nice laptop and a mobile phone with a data plan and has access to all those sorts of uh, tools and skills and can have the loudest voice. That doesn't change uh, just because of the web. So both of those things are happening at the same time. So vosmob.net or Mobile Voices, uh, Voces Mobiles, is a project um, that's based out of Los Angeles um, where low-wage immigrant workers who are doing day labor and household work uh, work together with designers and developers and some researchers to use collaborative design and participatory design and popular education and create a blogging platform that, where low-wage workers can use cheap mobile phones uh, to post stories to the web using SMS and voice calls and multimedia messaging. So a lot of working class people don't have a computer at home or broadband access. They don't have a smartphone necessarily with a data plan, but they do have a feature phone, maybe with a camera and a multimedia messaging package and definitely voice calls and SMS. And so we built a whole system together uh, called Vosmob, where if you go there, you'll see a lot of stories from sort of daily life uh, produced by these uh, immigrant workers you know, in LA. And pretty soon we're gonna be launching a hosted version of that same tool uh, called Vojo, uh, where anyone can come and create their own group for mobile blogging uh, using dumb phones. Yeah, to be, to be totally honest, like, I think that a lot of the apps that were developed, like, there's a lot of interesting concepts and demo design. Um, I'm not sure how much any of them were actually really used in a mobilization context. Um, not least because, like, you know, what happens, you go to a demo, you've got your phone, you run out of batteries first thing, you're trying to like take lots of images and then it's gone. So in, ultimately the face-to-face -face is the best app, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, Dan Schultz, who's at Slifty on Twitter, and myself, we launched Newsjack last week. And within a day, it already had uh, thousands of people visiting and several hundred remixes. But within 24 hours, we got a takedown 
uh, threat from the New York Times. Uh, they weren't happy about the idea that people would be remixing the front page of the New York Times. And we went back and forth with them uh, a little bit, and actually they relented, um, partly because we sort of were talking to them, explaining that this is a tool not just for uh, political satire, which it is, but also a tool that we really think people can use uh, for civic action, for satire, to create transformative works. And so we really want to fight to sort of defend the right of netizens to do, uh, you know, remix work online. So go and make remixes with Newsjack and uh, then send us the links uh, to the ones you're especially proud of. I really want everybody to go to newsjack.in. That's N-E-W-S-J-A-C-K dot I-N. And go there and then remix the news. So Newsjackin lets you create all the news that you'd like to see. You can just pick any news site, the one you always hated that always talks about you and your community in terrible ways and disses your mobilization and you just hate the framing. Just go there and, and then you can put in that site and then you can just click to remix it. So check it out. <laughs>